Horrible is back to regularly scheduled programming, but during my hiatus, I was able to scrap together a new intro to debut for you, and I can't wait for it. A little early for trick-or-treaters. Maggie, what? What happened? What happened? Uh, a razor blade in your dog treat? So, somebody get help! What was that? You damn dogs, get back here with my intro! Do you have any idea I used to live here? Me either, they don't disclose that information. Stupid thieving dogs taking my intro. Michael, you've... you come home? Wait a second. You've never lived here before. Twelve movies, it's always been the Myers house, not the Myers apartment. Can you, can you get out of my room, please? I'm, I'm trying to review your new movie, dude. This is extremely rude. Welcome to Horrible's first cinematic breakdown, as I throw my little tiny droplet into the never-ending stream of Halloween Kills reviews. That being said, typically I'm probably going to avoid those heavy main releases, stuff like Basket Case 2021, I mean uh, Malignant, or Hunger Game, I mean Squid Game. There's like 20,000 channels discussing all those type of big releases, so why the hell would you come to me for that? But the Halloween franchise is the root of my horror fandom. The first video I did was a discussion dedicated to Halloween Kills. So obviously I was going to come review this movie and I really just want people to talk about it with. And hopefully I can maybe point something out that you didn't notice or open up a perspective that you might not have thought about. Before we get into the rundown, I guess I'm supposed to do some kind of spoiler-free review, right? That's how these things go? Well, cue the poorly produced graphic. It's really fun and I fucking loved it. Yeah, I fall into the camp of people who very, very, very much enjoyed this movie. Yeah, it's got its flaws, and I'm going to get into those. But overall, this is the Halloween movie that I've wanted my entire life. But I have come to appreciate the divisiveness of this movie because it keeps people talking about it and keeps it relevant. So the movie starts in kind of seemingly a weird place where we're catching up with Cam finally, and he's trying to get a hold of Oscar on the phone, who we know is fucking dead. I say it's a seemingly strange place to start, and this kind of feeds into one of the bigger complaints I've seen about the movie, which is that it's a little messy and the plot's kind of all over the place. But to me, the root of this just seems like a giant Easter egg. Halloween 1 and Halloween 2 can easily be watched back to back as one whole movie. I feel like that they were going for something real similar here with 2018 and Halloween Kills. So he sees and finds Hawkins still alive, bleeding out the neck, and I'm happy because I love Coach Yost. Hold on to that ball, Petey. Overall, I thought it was pretty well acted and a lot of Loomis energy from Hawkins, and then we fade into what's probably my favorite part of the whole movie. So besides shading in Hawkins' character a bit more, giving us backstory on him, this is to replace the canon of what was Halloween 2 with what happened after Loomis shot him six times! And let me tell you something. They absolutely fucking crushed this flashback. The aesthetic is perfect. The score is flawless. And the mask looks so good. And this is without question the best portrayal of the shape as far as posture, body movements, and just embodiment that I've seen since the original. And I really like Hawkins' partner's whole spiel about how Michael would stare out his sister's window. I feel like it adds a lot of depth of character to Michael, but also a lot of mystery at the same time, so that was really well done. Then we cut to Lonnie getting bullied by what appears to be the McPoyles from that 70s show. Cop pulls up, tell him to all get the hell out of there, and Lonnie trips when he's running home on the sidewalk. Another just excellent shot of the shape. Cops showed up, Myers isn't there, and oh look, they're at the Myers house, they go and start searching it. It's a really good suspense scene, which ends in what I think is a really good jump scare and classic Myers attack. We can all be honest, this Loomis looks great, and it was such a joy to see the character brought back to life that accurately. It was a full-on prosthetic, no deep fake CGI. That's really impressive. The flashback ends when Michael gives himself up in the front yard, and I really love the zoom out shot because it's very reminiscent of him in the clown suit as a kid in the first one, right into our awesome title card with the blazing pumpkins. And at this point, this was all very much Halloween heroin. Considering not a shred of that was in the amazing trailer, from this point on, this movie was already great in my books. 
Then we're in a bar and we get introduced to all the legacy characters and we're introduced to the couple that were wearing the doctor and nurse outfits and the guy couldn't find a stethoscope that led into that really great one take in the first movie. Let's go ahead and get this complaint out of the way as well. Yeah, the legacy characters were pretty much wasted in this movie. I think they would have been a lot better off had they spread out the legacy characters over the three movies like maybe Nurse Chambers is in the first one, this one was Tommy and Lonnie, and then Lindsay gets her own movie in the third. Although I do think they saved a certain legacy character for the third movie that uh, I'll get into a little bit later. But even that idea wasn't going to save Tommy's character. I don't think they did a good job writing him. A lot of complaints are going towards Anthony Michael Hall, but he really couldn't have done much else. The character was very one-dimensional and mostly just kind of annoying. From what I remember hearing, they reached out to Paul Rudd to reprise his role. I think had that happened, this character would have instantly been 10 times more enjoyable. I do think it's funny how the scene ends after Tommy's weird shape propaganda monologue and he goes, to Lori, wherever you may be. Dude, it's Haddonfield. She's like down the street. I also really want a home decor sign that says, love lives today, but evil dies tonight. Then we get that quick shot of the trailer of Lori doing a really bad Usher impression. And then we get our firefighter slaughter. I genuinely felt for that dude when those shutters came up and it was just Michael standing there. And then he just gets brained with whatever that tool was. Just brutal. And it lets you know that Michael is not here to fuck around this movie. Now I'm not gonna lie. It's a little weird seeing Michael take on a group of people like that and make those quick movements. I think the only other time that that situation really occurred was in Halloween 6. And that was mostly off screen. But if it's gonna give us those really great shots and that really great weapon variation, then you know what? I'm here for it. Fuck it. Then we get to Haddonfield Memorial and oh hey look it's Sheriff Brackett and he like smells Lori's presence or something. I'm really glad they gave Karen that scene to acknowledge and kind of deal with the fact that her husband was killed. I wasn't a fan of his character and his peanut buttery penis but they did seem to have a loving marriage and I feel like her character really needed that moment of anguish. But it's also really funny that she's still in that Christmas sweater. <laughs> So after some free gore via Lori surgery and some character stuff, we cut to uh, an older couple, one of which is the caretaker of the graveyard that was talking about Bernie Mac in the first one. So after a couple watches of the first movie, one of my main complaints ended up being that it really just felt like it was Danny McBride talking to Danny McBride for 90 minutes. And there's a lot less of that in this movie, and I'm very thankful for that. But this old guy is definitely one of those times where I was like, oh, this is Danny McBride. He might as well have fucking played the dude. So they're talking about how Lori's house is on fire. The guy has this line where he's like, oh, it looks like from upstairs they put it out. And my roommate looks at me when we were watching it. He goes, did Michael put the fire out? The visual of Michael standing there with a hose to put the house fire out, I wish it was a thing. This scene is just another great example of how in this movie Michael is just pure brutality, both physically and psychologically. I really like the shot of him pulling the husband out of the pool of blood. It looks just so gross. I love the idea that like we always see Michael set up bodies but we never actually see Michael set up bodies so it's cool to see him take all the knives and stab them into dude's back while Sandra has to watch. I don't love however the posture while he does it yeah it's a little nitpicky but the way he's like spread out and the way his hands like don't really know what to do like he's Ricky Bobby or something I just wasn't my favorite thing but I do love how they end the scene with the clap transition back into the bar was very good, very nicely done. After some cool shots of the carnage from the firefighter massacre and checking in with the most underutilized character of the franchise, our guy in the black cowboy hat, we then get the broadcast announcing that two inmates are missing. And I kind of figured the switcheroo in the car was coming because Michael wouldn't listen to that kind of music. This is also where the mob mentality of the movie starts to form. And it kind of feels like a reference to Halloween 4, but taken up to the extreme. But one of many missed opportunities in this movie, I really feel like this mob should have accidentally killed Ted Hollister again. It was also really cool to see Julian get some shine again, even in a quick little news cameo. That kid was the MVP of the first movie. I also saw this little detail pointed out where the guy in the doctor costume, as he's walking out of the bar, forgets his stethoscope. And he also forgot his stethoscope in the first one. That's just really good movie to movie continuity. So after Not the Penguin crashes the car into the electrical thingy, like the car's name was Bucky, we then cut and are introduced to our MVPs of this movie, Big John and Little John. Yay! I really like Scott MacArthur from his role on The Mick, and it's cool to see Michael McDonald in this role, especially for the memes. I absolutely love the Halloween song that he's dancing to, but of course it's interrupted by some stupid kids, probably the descendants of those 70s McPoyles fucks. The Johns try to scare the kids with the tale of the Myers house because that's where they live. I'm not too sure Mikey's gonna like what you did with the place. I did like the comedic touch of he stabbed his sister in the tits. Stupendous. Then we're back in the hospital, and yeah, I'm not gonna lie, most of the hospital stuff is pretty boring. They went a little too far with the reference of Halloween 2 with having Lori be in there the entire movie. So mostly just gonna skim over these scenes. These ones are mostly to remind us that Sartain brought Michael to Lori, and to establish the theme that it's actually not Lori versus Michael, but it's Michael versus Haddonfield. 
And this is also to let our final girl family know that Michael is actually still alive and at large, to which we get a great reaction from Allison. I feel like Andy, as an actor, really made a big jump from the first movie to the second movie, and I very much enjoyed her performance this time around. Cameron also reunites with Allison and convinces her to join the hunt for Michael. Then it's some weird mix of, like, Paul Revere as they ride around warning everyone about Michael and Tommy's out there trying to recruit people. Stout and nonsense shape rhetoric. Then another one of my favorite scenes, an obvious Halloween reference when he climbs up on the car and does the hand on the window thing. Another seriously missed opportunity here as Michael's going to kill Marion. She goes, this is for Dr. Loomis and there's no bullets in the gun. First of all, that's disrespectful. And they could have easily fixed it, but no. Michael only stabs her four times. He should have stabbed her six times! This is how you do something for Dr. Loomis but damn it if they didn't win me right back over with that eye stab. Ooh, it might be my favorite kill in the whole movie. Lindsay pops back up and does her best stitches impression by putting that brick in his face. But what he gonna do with it is grab her by the throat and throw her against a car, accompanied by an awesome score. Then we get a great suspense scene with great sound design, and I absolutely love the murky shot of Michael walking across the bridge and the reflection of the water. Quick hospital scene where Karen lies to Lori about Michael being alive and Allison not being after him. Frank gets wheeled in. Then we get a really good scene that I enjoyed between Lonnie, Cameron, and Allison. I think it's a very realistically portrayed scene by everybody involved. I really like Lonnie, the character in general. Again, another example of that movie-to-movie -movie continuity where he jokes that uh, her dad used to sell him peyote, but in the first movie, Allison's dad joked that he used to to sell him peyote, so it's funny that they kind of place the blame on each other. Pull up and meet up with Tommy at the playground, see all of Michael's new Halloween decorations, and I really like the detail of all the candy sprinkled on. Then the hospital scene I was not bored with, despite its overly sappy score. The interactions with Lori and Hawkins are just so cute and adorable, and it actually gives us quite a bit of background information. We find out that they kissed one night at a bar when Lori was all drunk and that they kind of liked each other. But then Hawkins says, but you were sweet on Ben Tramer. Halloween 2 in this timeline never happened. Ben Tramer's not dead. I'm telling you, and you heard it here first, Ben Tramer will be in the third movie. Back at the hospital, Tommy's dropping off Lindsay and tells them to take her to the emergency room even though she was just strangled and is probably fine. He then obnoxiously incites panic and mass hysteria in the hospital because Karen tells him that Michael's coming to the hospital for Lori, and then he busts into Lori's room and tells her that Michael's still alive and is out there killing people. Lori's upset, gets mad at Karen, and this is actually the one scene where I feel like they showed Tommy's character had more than one dimension, and he actually seemed to care a lot about Lori and wanting to do this for Lori. It also was another missed opportunity because as Lori tells him to go do whatever, he, she should have said, do as I say. She then injects herself and probably has her best scene of the movie as she says, let him come for me and take his head as I take his, which might be a little foreshadowing to how the third movie concludes. Cut back to our MVPs, Big John and Little John. Yay. And they're watching what is apparently what you get when you order the room off of Wish, which is then interrupted with Michael playing a little prank in which he apparently has to sprint off screen to do. I really like the nice subtle comedy in the scene. I mean, in general, that... Lil John is the bigger one, and Big John is the little one, and then Big John takes the little knife, and Lil John takes the big knife. Definitely probably should have stuck with the golf club for range, but you know, who gives a shit? Just like the cops in the flashback, they do a terrible job doing a search of the house as they are constantly vocally giving away their position. Big John's death is definitely the other contender for best kill for me. I thought it was really interesting that he gets stabbed in the armpit. That's different. And then obviously the crushing of the eyes is just so gory and so good. I feel like a lot of this hospital madness that ensues afterwards probably could have been shortened up a little bit just for runtime's sake, but I do love that Lori gets in a good knee of that doctor that tried to give her the business. But again, I really love the scene with Hawkins and Lori and how it builds on their relationship that I've already enjoyed so far in the movie. But also, I love how it kind of solidifies this idea that Michael is so damn evil that he's infected the entire town. Kind of almost like how Pennywise does with Derry. And I'm not even saying that this whole scene with the with the patient getting closed in on by the by the mob is bad or that I didn't enjoy it because I think it's really well done, especially the score as he's breaking the window to jump off. And I'm not even going to say that I wish it wasn't in the movie because the gore from him falling and landing is totally worth all the time that we spent with this character. But the whole thing just kind of feels really out of place and more like it belongs in the Dark Knight trilogy or some shit. Hawkins drops the bomb on Lori that Michael's not really after her and that it was Sartain. We had to get reminded of that whole mess. And then we got Lonnie and Allison and Cam all at the Myers house. Another big missed opportunity here as I really wish that Allison was kind of against the idea of Lonnie going in by himself. When he's about to go in there, she could yell, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. Lonnie gets got real quick and our final showdown starts. After they search for a while, I absolutely love that Michael set up the Johns like he did. It's really nice to know that Michael's an inclusive slasher. It was nothing personal. 
And while Cameron's death is a bit underwhelming overall, I did like that it's a very direct reference to Brady's death in Halloween 4. When you think about it, Cameron is a lot like Brady the character in general, so it makes sense as a good reference. The whole chase mask off thing is not my favorite, but some fun stuff from this beatdown scene. On like my third watch, I noticed that there's a truck that pulls up that is very similar, probably the same one to the truck with that awesome scene towards the end of Halloween 4. And yes, there is an entire Facebook group dedicated to the lady who brought an iron to fight Michael Myers. Also, this beatdown scene is more evidence to, I actually think they did write the Tommy Doyle role for Paul Rudd. Because it's very reminiscent of the theatrical ending of Halloween 6 when Paul Rudd beats Michael to a pulp with that pipe. Only this time it's turned up to fucking 12. I liked the way it was shot when Michael fought back and slaughtered all the townspeople. That was well done. I was a little disappointed until my prediction came true and Karen got got. I called it. All in all, I don't want to be too reactionary, but I absolutely fucking love this movie. It could end up being my favorite Halloween movie of all. Was it a little messy and a little disjointed? Sure, but this is also the same franchise that has a continuity fuckery of four different timelines. So I'm all about respecting people's opinions, and I totally get how this movie might not land with you. But I think a lot of people just forget that these are slasher movies. Slasher movies are supposed to be fun, and I have not had so much fun watching a movie in a very long time. And I'm really stoked to see what they do with Halloween Ends, which I already read is apparently going to do a time jump and going to be in contemporary time. So that should be interesting how they work that into the storyline. Is Laurie going to be hunting Michael? Is Allison going to be hunting Michael and trying to get Laurie to join her? Is Michael just going to come back and hunt both of them? So let me know if there's anything I missed, any Easter eggs I glossed over. Let's discuss. Let's debate. Let's do it respectfully, though, because at the end of the day, we're all on Team Horror, and it's just fun to talk about the movies that we love or don't love. And I also can't wait to talk with you all about what we think is going to happen in Halloween Ends. I cannot wait for them to debut Ben Tramer. If they don't, that will be horrible. <laughs>